Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and today I want to chat with you guys a little bit about what I consider to be the two most important lower body exercises. And actually, we could almost call these full body exercises, but I consider these to be the most important. Um, I prescribe them to all of my clients all of whom get great results. And it's something that I really want to insist that people do these two things. And there's gonna be a lot of resistance out there because I know that there are coaches and experts and other people who don't think these are good exercises. But I will tell you guys with all honesty, these are the movements that I've used to build my 550 raw squat. These are the movements that I've used to build my 615 conventional deadlift. In my 40s, I have clients whose squats and deadlifts have gone up by 50 pounds or more who were advanced lifters already. And we focus on these movements. And I have my people focus on these, whether they're novice lifters or advanced lifters or anything in between. It works very, very well. And people would say, so why these two movements? Um, it has to do, number one, with the performance elements that they bring to the table. And number two, it has to do with the fact that they have a very high stimulus to fatigue ratio relative to other movements uh, that have axial loading. So what do we mean? What's going on? Well, with the box squat, we're dealing with the squat variation that has the highest rate of force production, has the highest rate of force production. You can consistently always control the range of motion. So it teaches you to be explosive from a predetermined height. Uh, it's a movement that can train you on your mobility. If you, if you are doing a normal back squat and you don't have the range of motion and mobility to do a really wide stance, which is the stance that most of you are going to be strongest at. And I want to make that very, very clear. I want to be very, very clear. You will be able to lift the most weight with the widest stance that you can comfortably do. The biomechanics around that don't lie. A lot of times people will say things like, oh, you should be able to lift more with low bar than with high bar. I disagree with that. There's no biomechanical reason for that. Stance width it matters, though. And I think the difference there is that a lot of people confuse stance width with bar position. In other words, a lot of people out there just use a wider stance when they go low bar. Right? They don't use a narrow stance. So they might do a narrow stance with high bar but they don't try to use the wider stance with it. And then when they go to low bar, they go to a wider stance and then they can magically lift more weight. And it's because it involves more muscles, right? The wider stance involves more muscles. So when you get more muscles involved in a movement, you can lift more weight. Furthermore, the wider your stance goes, the more upright you can keep your torso because your center of gravity is moved further back, right? If we're gonna keep the bar midfoot, if you think of your, your legs and knees relative to your pelvis as a, as a triangle, what happens when you open the angle up? Right? You shift that whole line, the, the hypotenuse there, you shift it further back. You stick closer to the, the opposite point. Stance width does that. So the box squat allows you to train the mobility of a wider stance and it allows you to have perfect control because you can adjust heights, you can adjust other things as you go and you can build that mobility and you can learn to be explosive from the very bottom because you have to come to that dead stop. All right, so it, it trains you to have the mobility that you need for this. Furthermore, it teaches you again to have the, the feet out to get a wider stance that carries over better to sports right? It improves unilateral balance because the wider your feet go, the more evenly you have to press both feet to lift. It's harder to use compensatory strength, so it tends to build more balance strength, right? It builds more balance strength, builds more explosiveness, builds mobility. Then on top of it, because it's harder, arguably 5 to 10% more difficult, it forces us to use a lighter weight to build the same amount of strength and muscle. In other words, to, to get maximum muscle fiber recruitment, you're still gonna be forced to use a lighter weight. It ends up making it very easy to recover from. All right, it is, it is an easier squat to recover from. So if it's easier to recover from, relative to the amount of muscle fibers that we recruit, our stimulus to fatigue ratio is quite good. So it's still a squat, and the squat still has axial loading, which can be hard to recover from, but 
compared to other squats, it's better there. On top of that, let's come back over to another recovery issue. Puts less shear on the knee. Now, when we talk about shear on the knee and knee slide, we aren't saying that that's going to damage your knee, but it is more stress on your knee, and therefore it could limit the total amount of training volume that you could do without starting to develop discomfort in the joint. All right, so we can get more total training volume in. And for people who say, well, does it carry over? Of course it carries over. You guys have watched me make it carry over. I have clients who it's carried over. They don't do a back squat for months. We get strong on the box squat. They walk in and PR. Okay. As a general rule, if you box squat correctly, you will be able to back squat more weight than you box squat. It might only be 10 pounds difference, but it will be more the first time you try it. And if it doesn't carry over, you're not performing the exercise correctly. It has carryover. So why the good morning? Well, we need a hip hinge. And as I pointed out, out of all the various hip hinges that we could be doing, the good morning, because of the position up on the neck and the moment arm involved, we get a larger training response in the posterior chain with a lighter weight or with any given weight. So therefore, in order to get the same amount of training stimulus to the posterior chain relative to any other hip hinge, like one where you're holding it in your hands, such as a Romanian deadlift, we have less weight on our back. And if we're using less weight, we have less axial loading. It's easier to recover from. In fact, most people find that they can do very, very high volumes of good mornings. It's not uncommon to have limit sets of 10, 15, 20 reps to do five of them twice a week. To end up doing 10 sets of good mornings and recovering from it. It's a very versatile exercise. Out of all the various hip hinges that we could be doing, the good morning allows the most variety of barbells. It's easy to put bands, chains, anything you need on it. It's easy to change your foot stance to adjust emphasis of things like erector versus hamstring. All right, this movement allows us to have a lot of variation in what we want to focus on. I mean, the good morning, it just represents a movement. As far as the equipment that we use on it and our stances, we actually could have seven or eight different exercises that are all good mornings. It lends itself to, to high volume training very easily. It can also be done for max work. We'll build your deadlift. You can still build a max deadlift off of it without deadlifting as long as you train your grip also. All right, it's a very, very versatile tool. But here's the main thing. It creates a stretch reflex in the hamstrings. It is one of the few exercises that we can do, hip hinges available, that creates a stretch reflex in the hamstrings and heavily utilizes the erectors at the same time. All right. And we know that a stretch reflex, and again, it has to do with the, the stretch shortening cycle, has an enormous amount of hypertrophy potential. All right, the good morning allows for very, very large amounts of hypertrophy. It's also very easy to recover from, so we can do a lot of training volume with it. So what does that mean? It means we have a very high stimulus to fatigue ratio. So we can get a stretch reflex. We work the entire posterior chain, and even depending on the variation, you do all the way up to the T-spine. It can be done even with bands if you have to. All right, this movement brings a ton to the table. So what happens when we pair this together with the box squat? We end up with a squat with the highest rate of force production, gives amazing unilateral balance, low shear stress on the knee, that we can train with very, very high volumes. Right? We combine that with a movement that allows us to have a hip hinge, which again, very high stimulus to fatigue ratio, in which we can train very large amounts of volumes, builds a lot of work capacity and low back, builds mobility, has a stretch reflex on the hamstrings. So what we get here are two exercises that are not only strength movements, they're hypertrophy movements. They both improve mobility of the low body. Right? They both have the ability to improve mobility and range of motion while simultaneously being massive muscle builders and strength builders. All right, they're perfect exercises. If you did nothing else but these two movements and variations of them and trained them really hard for your low body, 
you would build a hell of a foundation. All right, guys, well, that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.